the truth behind artificial sweeteners. Here are people consuming diet drinks and gaining weight. Find out why if you're drinking just one a day, you are at risk. Plus, award-winning singer and songwriter Nicole C. Mullen joins us in studio on today's 700 Club Interactive. Good morning and welcome to the show. If you're one of the millions of Americans who drink or eat anything with artificial sweeteners, please listen to our first story. We've warned you about the dangers of these fake sugars for years. And now, as Lori Johnson explains, they not only can hurt your brain and heart, they might even cause you to gain weight. This country's weight problem is only getting worse. The CDC reports a staggering 71% of adults qualifies as overweight or obese. The result? Things like heart disease, cancer, diabetes. In June, the New England Journal of Medicine reported the whole world is getting fatter and paying a price. Four million deaths, 60% caused by obesity, but the other 40% by just being overweight. Health experts say the root cause of our weight problem can be summed up in one word, sugar. Most Americans consume about 160 pounds of it a year. Oftentimes, it's hidden in foods you'd never expect, like yogurt, peanut butter, pasta sauce, and bread. Then other times, it's right out front, like in soda. This one can contains more than nine teaspoons of sugar. It's no wonder so many people turn to diet sodas containing zero-calorie artificial sweeteners to reduce their sugar intake. But that's a bad choice for a number of reasons. A new Boston University study revealed people who drank diet soda have three times the risk of developing dementia and having a stroke. And that's people who just drink one a day. So artificial sweeteners, we think, are much worse than we ever thought. The Cleveland Clinic's Dr. Michael Roizen says artificial sweeteners like aspartame, saccharin, and sucralose can disrupt what's known as our microbiome. Your microbiome is the bacteria inside your gut. Those artificial sweeteners cause a separate breed of bacteria to grow inside you. Neurologist David Perlmutter says artificial sweeteners throw off the delicate balance of good and bad bacteria. The bacteria that live within our gut nurture the brain when they're treated right. They reduce inflammation, for example. Inflammation is the key player that causes multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, and even Alzheimer's and coronary artery disease and diabetes for that matter as well. Perlmutter says in addition to avoiding artificial sweeteners, consider taking probiotics to increase good bacteria and prebiotics to maintain healthy levels. We consume artificial sweeteners to control our weight, but believe it or not, a number of scientific studies show they actually cause us to gain weight. One reason goes right back to the gut. The body thinks it's starving and holds on to every calorie that a person consumes. So here are people consuming diet drinks and gaining weight. And that doesn't seem to make any sense. And yet we now see those, uh, that it's happening uh, because of changes in the gut bacteria. The risk of developing diabetes is dramatically increased twofold in people who drink a lot of sugarless beverages. Who knew? Nutritionist J.J. Virgin says the artificial sweeteners stevia, xylitol, erythritol, and monk fruit appear to be better choices for the gut. However, they can still lead to weight gain. But there's also a phenomenon that happens called calorie dysregulation that they saw with artificial sweeteners. When you eat, a, eat something that's got a sweet taste with no calories, your body can't calibrate the degree of sweetness with how many calories, so it causes you to tend to overeat. Then there's our own DNA. Genetics predispose an estimated three-fourths of us to have an addiction to sweets, meaning the more we take in artificial sweeteners, the more we crave all sweets. That's why health experts recommend removing the taste for sweets altogether. Sweet is a learned taste. If you go off sweet, if you go off sugar, if your brain doesn't get used to it, if your taste buds don't get used to it, you can avoid it 
and that's a much healthier state. Virgin proved this theory with 700 sugar addicts. First, we taper down for a week. We don't cook cold turkey, but then we lower their sugar impact down. We start using more spices and more savory and getting enough protein in and getting healthy fats in. And then at the end of two weeks, we go back and test. And these sugar addicts told me that sweet food just tasted gross. So while eating too much sugar is definitely hazardous, artificial sweeteners can be just as bad for you, maybe worse. That's why the healthiest solution is to remove all sweets from your diet, both real and fake. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Thank you, Lori. Great report. Terry, I used to drink diet sodas. There's a Did particular you? diet soda I liked. Yeah. And then I noticed the more I drank it, the longer I drank it, and my stomach would get upset. And it was really? a regular routine. I just had to stop it. Once in a while, I'll have it again, and my yeah. stomach always gets upset. Not surprising to hear some of that. I used to drink great. Well, I, I guess for a while I drank one and then the other regular and then and then diet. And, you know, there's they are thirst quenching in that moment. And there's it's hard to find something that replaces that immediate. And it's not going to make me fat, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, now great. to find that out, it's yeah. like, really? <laughs> I, There's I no justice. I don't think I can sue many artificial sweeteners. I'll give me a good yeah. bowl of ice cream for the sweets. Yeah, That's well, what I'll I'm take. with you on that. And but you know, lots of people I see still using artificial. They're on almost every restaurant yeah. table in the world. So, knowing what they do, we ought to. Yeah. That's good information to have. Yeah. Well, we're raising awareness today, and here's a statistic that may surprise you: one in 200 women are colorblind. And while that number may not be staggering, consider this. 12% of males, or nearly 300 million men around the world, have some form of colorblindness. And I happen to be one of them. Not a surprise if you've seen me dress at work here. <laughs> Recently, I discovered what it would be like to see what I've been missing. Take a look. I don't see any number in there. I don't see any number in there. I don't see any number there. 12. When I was a little boy, I took a colorblindness test. It probably wasn't as sophisticated as these online. It was just in a book, but I did not do well. And then from then on, I was just told, Andrew, you're colorblind, and so is your older brother. Very occasionally, I'll have trouble with traffic lights at night. It's not often, but maybe twice a year, I'll go, whoa, is that yellow or red? There was one evening where I thought a light was yellow and it was actually red, and I did the quick stop, arm out over my wife, and she said, why don't you let me take it from here? These tests, these colorblindness tests, sometimes I'll do okay on them and I'll feel like they're kind of easy, but then other times I don't have a clue, like this one I'm looking at now, I have no idea what, there's a, supposed to be a number in this circle of colors and very often I have no idea that there's a number in there. I don't see anything in there either at all. Just a bunch of different colors, it looks like a snow cone. So I had enough family members and even coworkers saying, hey, you're colorblind. Haven't you seen these videos of all these colorblind people putting on special glasses and then suddenly seeing colors? For some of them, it's very dramatic and emotional. Um, maybe it will be for you. So we contacted a company and said, would you send me a pair of these colorblind glasses so I could try them on? And they've been in my office for about two weeks and a number of people have said, how can you stand not opening it and trying to see what they do for you? But I've been waiting and I'm really looking forward to seeing if there's any difference in my vision from putting these on. I bet they're looking very good. I think they're going to be stylish and they, maybe they'll improve my overall look. All right, here they are. I'm looking forward to seeing what they do. There they are. Great. Hey, Brady. How you doing? Good. I see what this no, I can't look yet. I'm not All right, here we go. Let's see. Oh my gosh. What? <laughs> if if this is what I've been missing, it's really incredible. It is really incredible. Wow, it's so, it's so bright. This looks, what color is this? That looks very different to me. How do I look, by the way? There's some sort of like, oh gosh. Like the leaves on the trees look different. And the way the sky and the buildings reflect a little bit. Um, I don't even know how to describe it. Pretty cool. It does look brighter. Yeah. The colors too. Well, let me see them one more time. It's not like astounding difference because I only saw black and white and now I see color. 
but the colors look very different. <laughs> There's a whole lot going on in here that I didn't see before. Like shades of it maybe? Is this navy blue? I still love that, that's still my favorite color. I can't believe the, the studio crew is, and my co-host are mocking me because I said, it's so bright. It's, it, it's someone, just, someone it's yelled, so, it's, it is. Someone yelled, that's a college graduate in the back of the, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a very different yeah. experience. In fact, I, I don't know if it did change the overall look. What do you think? I is think it's very hip. Here's you the look thing. even more stunning, <laughs> well, Terry. Keep those on, Terry, friend. <laughs> What is amazing to me about that is that a, such a bright hue in the lens yeah. corrects things. Now, I mean, I that's so odd. I don't think this is exactly what you see, but it's certainly giving me a lot of experience that I, I never had that? before. Sure. That's They're going to have to maybe redo our makeup afterward underneath. It's okay. <laughs> see, I... <laughs> they look good on you. Well, thank you should you be skiing much. in Vail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I should be. <laughs> but, Wow. So that makes, like when you look at those lights through these, are they pink? There's some, there's some, uh, a new set in the back there we're looking at. Yes, it looks very pinkish. It's different. It's, the outside was incredible to see the difference. Wow. So it was fun. My kids really wanted me to do it. So here's my second question is, are you one of those people, like, do you have little tags on your clothes in your closet? Because you are always coordinated that and very so well nice dressed. That is so nice of you, really? Yeah, really. And so do you, I mean, I do you a, mark like blue, gray? My, like my wife is very kind to me and, um, she helps me out. I think when I was single, you I might have never had. Tick her well, off, there you have be been in days. Deep I'm telling deep you. Trouble. Some mornings, maybe I'll say, "Does this match?" And I'll get a. Uh. <laughs> and I know I, can, I don't know if I can yeah, trust that. She, to she, the closet. She helps me a lot. <laughs> so, uh, which camera are we on here? Let's go over here. I'd like to thank Vino Optics for these glasses and the That's technology awesome. that made this possible. If you're one of the hundreds of millions living with color blindness and would like to experience color, go to vino.vi for more details. That is not to be confused with Vino the wine, Terry. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. You might go there, too. It's hard to say. <laughs> and up next, the award-winning singer and songwriter who's helping young people in her neighborhood and all around the world. Nicole C. Mullen joins us in the studio. Stay with us. Our next guest started singing when she was just two years old and gave her heart to Jesus when she was eight. Nicole C. Mullen was writing songs by the age of 12, and it wasn't long before she became an award-winning artist. Nicole C. Mullen has a distinctive sound and songwriting ability. She's best known for the hit Redeemer. And is the first African-American artist to win Dove Awards for Song and Songwriter of the Year. Nicole's award-winning music transcends culture. Her new album, Like Never Before, continues to build on that tradition. Nicole C. Mullen joins us now, and what a treat to have you in studio with us. Aww. You grew up in the church. Your mom and dad yes. were pastors. Deacons. Deacons. And, and grandparents and were pastors. Your grandparents yes. were yes. pastors. Wow, rich heritage yes. there. Yes. Yet another generation, in right? Church, eight, nine, ten days a week. Wow. Yeah, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But it really powerfully impacted your life. I was reading about... Um, some of the things you went through as a child when you went to school and kids yeah. called you homemade. Yeah. And that was something yeah. you hadn't really experienced in church yeah. or at home. No. But that teaching from church and home helped you process that positively. Absolutely. And my relationship with Christ. I mean, yes. my, my relationship there with Him and also, like you're saying, my parents teaching me the value of who I was yeah. in Him and being reaffirmed in church. So when I was being insulted on the bus on the yes. way to school, my sisters and I, I could sustain it because I knew, you know, they could only hurt my feelings. That's the best yeah. that they can do, but they can't change my destiny. But what wisdom on your part? You know, a lot of people let that define them. Yeah, it, it was one of those things. So I think it was because because I was young and I would daily commune with God before I would go to school. I'd mm. stand by the lamppost before the bus came and I'd say, okay, God, if nobody else will do it, I'll do it. If nobody else will go, I'll go. Wow. I'm your girl. We'd have these conversations, you know. And I so, need a session with your parents oh. and grandparents. <laughs> my parents I wanted the mom. That they were my great. Because, you know, my parents, they got us up every morning at 5 a.m. and they prayed with us. Really? So before we went to school, we had prayer time. And before yes. we walked out of the door, my mom laid hands on us to pray for favor and guidance. So well, you were covered. It was, we were covered. So yeah. when I was sitting on the bus, I remembered hearing or feeling the hope in my heart knowing that God is going to do something great. I don't know how, I don't know when, mm -hmm. but he still does Cinderella stories. And the parent, my parents said, 
and the grown-ups at church that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. That means he can still do great things yes. now. The same things yes. he did in the Bible, he can still do. You know, you have, in addition to your huge success musically, both singing and writing mm -hmm. and all recording, you have started these baby girl clubs around yeah. the country. And when did you realize that all young people didn't get what you got growing Ooh, up? Oh, you know, I think really it hit me when I was in school. You know, and I think it was things that I would take for granted. Even the fact, <clears throat> my dad and my mom were married for 54 years. My dad worked the same job for 38 years. Wow. And the fact that they would pour into us, we would have family night on Thursdays, you know, every week. And we weren't a perfect family, but my parents, they weren't hypocrites. And so I thought, you know what? It's good for me to model it in front of my own children. And that's mm -hmm. what I still aim to do. But there are other kids who need that same kind of a foundation. They need yes. the aunties to come alongside if their mom's yes. not doing it. They need the uncles that may say, I'll come and be that for you. And so I've been able to give back and to do that mm -hmm. in young lives and to inspire other women and men, you know, to say, I'm going to join arms with someone younger than me and I'm going to mm -hmm. mentor them as well. And I've seen their lives change because of it, both of their lives. What do you think is the greatest need in young people today? Because the world is just attacking who they were created to be, their image and likeness yeah. to God, their creator, just that sense of significance yeah. in them. That is it. They need that s sense of self of who am I? And why am I? And that only comes in the person of Jesus Christ. So in essence, they really need a relationship, not a list of roles. They don't need religion. They need a relationship with Jesus Christ. And they need other people to come around them to say, now let me help you walk this mm -hmm. out because the power of the Holy Spirit is in them to do it. Yes. They just need us to say, you know, this is how we live out the word. So what do you do in your baby girls clubs? Well, we'll sing in some of them. Some of them we dance, um, we memorize scripture, we eat, we do you Bible study. We have fellowship, study. really. We fell exactly. Yeah. And we get involved in, in each other's lives, really. It's, it's not hard. It's easy to do. It's so easy to do that I think a lot of people miss it because they think, it's something that has to be hard and you have to have a lot of money or be famous to do it. You don't. So tell me, how does one start one of these? Because you can't lead all of them. So yeah. do you find someone with the same passion you have to make an impact? And yes, I do. And then I've written a little curriculum and I've just been like, just take this as a blueprint. You don't have to do it exactly mm -hmm. like I do. You can like make it work for where you're at and your culture and the language that you speak. But these are essentials that I've seen that really do work. Mm -hmm. And so I've try to help them get started. And then I fan the flame and say, okay, now do what you're called to do. And now we have a model in the country of, of Zambia and awesome. in the country of Belize. And we've done one in the Dominican Republic. I don't know how that's doing. I'd have to check on it. <laughs> but so it's, it's, it's spreading. So if they're interested, they can reach out to us at NicoleCMullen.com mm -hmm. and we'll give them more information there. And that's for young people, but you've got these Arise, what is it called? Women's the Arise Conference. Experience Women's Conference. Conferences. Yeah, tell yes. us about that. Well, we're excited because we're doing our very first one coming up um, September the 8th and the 9th. Niagara Falls, New York. So if you're, people are interested, go to NicoleCMullen.com because there's a registration. See where else you're going to hold Absolutely. these. Absolutely. So year. we're doing this and we're going to get together and we're going to love on each other and we're going to share our stories and we're going to listen to the voice of the Lord as he calls us back to life yes. in those areas where we've been battered and bruised and wounded. And so um, we're doing that. And I, I love your concept of calling us back because, you know, scripture says that, you know, we've been called desolate and deserted, but God gives us a new name. And yes. so how wonderful yes. is that to yes. receive your new name from him and That's walk right. in the freedom of that. You've got a new release coming out like never before. Like never before. It's time to sing and dance and celebrate and love the Lord and to live like we've never lived before because we have the hope. We have the hope of Jesus Christ. And so it's our calling. it is our calling. Yeah. So the album is a celebration. <laughs> Whether of that. we sing like you or not, <laughs> It's our call and we can join in and make a joyful noise, that right? That we can, that we can. Well, I want to mention that Nicole's Arise Experience Conference Tour begins next month. She mentioned it, Niagara Falls, New York. You're first. You can sign up now. There you go. Yes. So get your name in there. You can check out all of that at CBN.com if you'd like more dates and information on where she's going to be throughout the year. And Nicole is set for an album release in September. It's the one we've been talking about. It's entitled like never before. So be sure to download it or pick up a copy where Wherever music is sold as soon as it's released. Great in the car, I might Yay. say. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful to have you here. Thank, Thank you, you, Terry. It's always a treat. Always a pleasure. Well, coming up, a seven-year-old boy is hit with the hard truth and struggles to cope. Yeah, I remember uh, threatening suicide. I remember laying in the middle of the street, just hoping cars would hit me. I really wasn't sure how to cope with that feeling of emptiness. 
find out how he finally found peace when we return. Well, Michael Schoening just wanted to belong. From the time he was a little boy, knowing who he was and that he had a family was all that mattered. At the age of seven, his world was turned upside down. There was a, a large part of my childhood that was enveloped by a feeling of not really belonging to something. It was a, just this pure sense of belonging that I really was craving. Michael Schoening was seven years old when he found out his mom's husband, the man he called dad, was not his real father. I remember lashing out. I remember running away. I remember uh, threatening suicide. I remember laying in the middle of the street, just hoping cars would hit me. I really wasn't sure how to cope with that feeling of emptiness, that feeling of, of, of something that I, that I didn't have. A short time later, a friend invited Michael to church where he prayed to become a Christian. And at that moment, I had the creator of the universe as my father. And that was, that was just an amazing feeling. I just became plugged in to a huge family. And that's what I really wanted was that feeling of being part of a big family. While the church gave Michael a sense of family, playing worship music brought him closer to God. Music for me was another dimension, like another world that I could enter into and worship God. Nothing else mattered, everything faded away. Then when Michael was 18, a close friend was killed in a car accident. It really made me question God for the first time. How can a believer in him just be gone, just like that. I didn't get it. I, I was angry at God, but I was more so um, really confused about why God let, would let something like that happen. The night of the funeral, Michael went to hang out with some mutual friends. The way that we coped at that time was basically just getting drunk, basically just getting high, getting drunk, trying to get the numbness so that we're not feeling the pain of our friend that just passed. And that was the first time in my life that I had, um, that I had been stoned, that I had been drunk. And it wasn't the last. Before long, Michael left his home and his church. He got into the local music scene where he found another family and plenty of drugs. I was trying to get that feeling again through drugs and alcohol that I was when I was worshiping God. But I knew in the back of my mind that it's gonna wear off. The next morning, uh, I would still have a hole. I'd still have a hole in my soul that I, would, that I didn't fill. So I'm just gonna have fun. I'm just gonna party. I'm just gonna pretend like I'm someone who I'm not. But the party came to an end when a flood destroyed his musical equipment and set off a chain reaction. I lose my apartment, I lose my car, I lose my job. It all happened at once. All this happened in maybe a month. I lose my friends because when I didn't have drugs, I didn't have an apartment, they were just gone. Michael felt he had nowhere to go and no one to turn to. I slept in the back of cars. I slept in abandoned homes. Um, I just slept wherever I could. Uh, I had done so much wrong. I was so tainted. I was so dirty. I was so filthy. God's not going to want a tainted child back into his kingdom. I mean, I was a homeless drug addict. That's what I was. One night, Michael met a youth pastor on the street who gave him a room in a church attic. He found a Bible and started reading. I felt like it was a pit, and I was sitting at the bottom of the pit. There's no ladder, there's no rope, and I put the Bible on me over my heart. And I just said, God, how did I get here? I remember him saying to me that he didn't leave. Even though I had tried to run away, I had turned my back on him, he really let me know that he never left. He was there the whole time and he kept me alive. He never tore up that contract, that offer of salvation. He never tore up that agreement. He just, he was just waiting for me to come back. I felt like I was home again. Michael stopped doing drugs and rediscovered God's grace and peace. He eventually became the youth pastor in the church where he had been staying. Today he's married and no longer has to question where he belongs. When I came back, I said, look, I've done all this stuff. Can I please just serve you? And then he puts a robe around you. And he puts a ring on my finger. He puts shoes on my feet. And he says, God just says, look, Mike, I've been waiting for you to come back. You've always been my son and I've always been your father.
that may sound familiar to you at the end when Michael was talking about the robe. You know, that's the prodigal son, Luke 15. That's what Michael was talking about. The illustration that Jesus used to talk about how Father God welcomes us back into his family with celebration. You may be like Michael and say, I'm too dirty, I'm too tainted. Those were Michael's words. I'm too dirty for God to take me back. But in that prodigal son story, we see Father God running to us, embracing us. There is no condemnation for those in Jesus Christ. If you're in a situation in your life where you're saying, God, I've wandered from you, I've tried other things to cope, that's what Michael said, we tried other ways of coping. For some it's drugs, for some it's alcohol, for some it's isolation. And you find yourself in a situation like Michael did, how did I get here? You need to know that the enemy lies to you and says that God doesn't want you back. You've blown it. Your chance is over. And I'm here to tell you today the good news that Jesus Christ makes relationship with our Heavenly Father possible because God will celebrate. Don't hesitate. Don't be fearful to say, Lord, I want to come back to you. I want to surrender my life to you. Because the enemy will lie to you and say that's not possible, but it is. Let's pray now if you're in that situation. Heavenly Father, I've wandered away. I've left you. Thank you for this story I've heard. How a man in a similar situation rediscovered the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for your work on the cross, the blood you shed for us, where you make salvation possible. It's nothing we can earn. It's because of Jesus' sacrifice that makes relationship with Father God possible. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like further prayer in your life, give us a call at 800-700-7000. We'd love to pray for you. We leave you with Psalm 68, verse five, a father of the fatherless, a defender of widows is God in his holy habitation.